Hi, uh, I'm Elizabeth Gabriel, KLCC's Journalism Fellow, and I would like to welcome you all to KLCC's virtual SNAP sign-up session, uh, information session. Um, KLCC is the local NPR station in Eugene, Oregon, and we're here to hopefully provide some more information that can be kind of difficult to figure out. Um, this event is in conjunction uh, with a series of stories I did on accessing higher education for students who are low income or experiencing homelessness. Uh, like many of you all tonight, I also experienced food insecurity while in college, um, which is partially why I wanted to do this story, um, but also to be able to kind of uplift and share the experiences of others who have gone through this um, and just give you all a chance to ask questions and kind of figure out um, the resources that are available to y'all. And so I want to say a huge thank you to LCC um, who with who is uh, helping host this event with technical technical assistance from Randy Painter. Um, this project was made possible with funding through the Education Buyers Association and the KLCC Public Radio Foundation. Um, and so tonight we'll start with a presentation for applying for SNAP. We'll have a Q&A session and then we'll have a conversation with a student who was able to receive SNAP in Oregon. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce y'all to some of tonight's speakers. Uh, we have Chloe Eberhardt, who has worked with Partners for Hunger, Partners for Hunger Free Oregon since 2015. Her work includes expanding SNAP access in Oregon and educating as well as advocating for more equitable policies and communities. Um, we also have Trisha Merrick, uh, with, who is a community partnership coordinator with the Oregon Department of Human Services. She focuses on connecting community members with resources through the department. And then we have Tina Dodge, who has worked at OSU Extension Service for 16 years. She is an associate professor of practice in Lynn and Benton County and coordinates both the SNAP outreach and SNAP ed programs. And she is fluent in Spanish. So if you have any questions in Spanish, uh, please don't hesitate to send those. Uh, now I'll officially pass it off to them. Everyone, um, it's Chloe with Hunger Free Oregon. I use she, her pronouns and um, thanks for having me here. I'm glad to be doing this with Trisha and Tina. We're gonna be talking uh, SNAP access for college students, um, specifically because you know it's a little bit complicated to access SNAP as a college student. Um, the policies really are built around um, a really outdated model of who is a student, um, at least on the federal level they are. Um, so it really takes makes you think that you need to be um, it excludes students under the kind of guise of thinking that most students have parental support or going to college right out of high school and are living on campus. And we just know that that is not the reality for Oregon students. Um, so today our goals, um, we're going to talk a little bit about SNAP, what it is, so that you can understand what that acronym is. So it doesn't just sound uh, like a bunch of alphabet soup. Um, and then college student eligibility, um, kind of dive into that a little bit more. And um, for me, I'm gonna talk about our Hunger Free Campuses initiative um, because we care about SNAP access, but we know that's not enough um, to meet college students and address kind of uh, the experiences that Elizabeth was talking about and wrote about. Um, and then we're going to hear from Trisha at Department of Human Services on the online application, kind of how you get connected with that, other support services that are with SNAP that come with it, time for question and answers, and then hear from Tina on Food Hero, how you spend SNAP, what that, what it can um, get you access to. So those are the goals. Um, ambitious, but I think we can do it. Um, so really wanted to ground us first in, and I know we're going to be hearing a little bit more um, from Dre later, who is just like such a great advocate. And um, But really, college hunger is not a rite of passage. Uh, there's a really old perception that college is about getting through with ramen or making ends meet with very little. And that's just not what we want to see happen. This is not something we should encourage or 
um, be okay with. There's systematic failures that are at place here or at play here that are making it really challenging for students to get by. Um, we know that 63% of Oregon Community College students identified it as their food insecure, housing insecure, or homeless um, pre-pandemic. That is crisis level. Um, and college students across the country are four times more likely to be experiencing hunger than the general public. So those are really, um, this is why at Hunger Free Oregon, where I work, uh, we focus on this issue. Um, and so it's also personal um, for our team. Why we do this work is because we have lived experience with food and housing insecurity. Um, for myself, I accessed the SNAP benefits um, when I, right after I graduated college, when I was really struggling to find work during the 2008 recession. Um, so for two years, it really helped me get by while I wasn't able to kind of get full-time work and um, helped me make ends meet in my life, keep paying off my student loans actually. So it's very helpful. But for our team, we ground that two of my teammates who work on hunger-free campuses with me, our campaign, um, experienced uh, basic need and security during college while they were student parents, um, really seeking to get access to new career opportunities, going to college, putting in all that work, but it just it was really challenging to um, make it all happen. And so I just wanted to give space as well because I think this is a pretty common experience. And um, yeah, I know, Trisha, maybe you wanted to share a little bit too. Yeah, thank you, Chloe. I think this is uh, really a great initiative that we're working on. Um, I've also experienced food insecurity as a student. I um, decided to go back to school when I moved to Oregon, um, having a hard time finding work myself, and found that SNAP was um, really what was going to lift up our family in order to continue to be able to um, make ends meet. And so SNAP, um, as a college student, you know, and I would joke as well that I'm just a poor college student, you know, I, I'm working really hard on on my education and trying to find part time work, but it was just really challenging. And so um, without those SNAP benefits, um, my family would have really, really struggled um, even more than, than we did. And so um, there's definitely a passion for wanting to get our students engaged. And I'm just appalled at the number of the percentage of students who are dealing with food insecurity and homelessness. And so the more that we can do to make this um, more accessible for students, the better. So thank you, Chloe. Yeah, thanks, Trish. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And um, Elizabeth too, um, as well. I think it just grounds us in that. This is a really common thing. And that, it just makes me feel like, um, oops, Sorry, y'all. Um, it just makes me feel like it leads me into why we have the Hunger Free Campuses campaign. Um, so really, we believe every college student has the right to be free from hunger and houselessness and financial distress because we want to ensure that students have access to um, school so they can really achieve what they dream of, what they want to do. We know that pathways out of um, poverty often involve education. Um, so our goal with Hunger Free Campuses is centering the experience and expertise of students um, to make systematic changes um, that will address really what's the root causes um, that are creating a system where college is more and more unaffordable, along with kind of the layer of living costs and balancing all of that when you're a student that may have children, um, maybe working on top of school and trying to make that all work. Um, right now um, here in Oregon, we are working to pass HB 2835, which um, would establish a benefits navigator at each Oregon community college and public university to help students connect to resources, kind of get the support they need to uh, fill out an application, understand eligibility, get connected, um, 
on their campus or in a virtual setting um, with someone who really understands the higher ed and financial aid landscape as well. So it can kind of navigate those worlds. Um, we've heard this from students over and over in Oregon when we did listening sessions and work with students throughout the state that this was really critical. Um, and we know that getting access to resources helps I um, meet unmet financial need, which for students here in Oregon, about um, a little over 40% of students have unmet financial need once you take into account scholarships, current financial aid, their own earnings and family contributions. So that's a lot of students. And so resources can help kind of close that gap. So if you wanna take action, wanna be involved in this, um, you can visit, uh, the OregonHunger.org slash Hunger Free Campuses and feel free to connect with us. We have an action there to um, show your support for this, uh, this bill, this session. Um, so just wanted to ground that uh, this is really what drives us, the advocacy behind this. And we know that both ensuring SNAP access, but then also really starting to change systems is what will really help um, us meet this uh, student food and basic need and security crisis. So, okay, I'm diving into the student eligibility um, and what that looks like when it comes to SNAP. Um, so uh, what I would say is that there's kind of three things to think about um, with student eligibility. And we have all of this on our website. Um, where you can kind of find all the details if you want to follow along or seek it out at a different time because it is a lot to process. Um, so, one second. Okay, so first it's um, if you are a student of higher education. So that's a part of it is to um, know whether or not in the eyes of the SNAP program, you're considered a student of higher education. And then if your income is at or um, below the guidelines. And then uh, for students, if you meet additional criteria. So um, that's kind of a part of this. Um, uh, that you kind of have to navigate those three things. I'm gonna move us along, oops, sorry. So first is if you're considered a student of higher education. So um, for those uh, folks, it's if you're 18 years of age or older, but under 50. So um, if you're over 50, you can still be a student. There's very much many students um, in Oregon that are 50 or older but you're just not considered that in the eyes of SNAP. So you don't have to meet additional requirements for students. So you can just really look at the income guidelines. Um, if you're attending an institute, uh, uh, institution of higher education, um, so that uh, what that is, is really it's an institution where traditionally you might need a GED or high school diploma for enrollment. Doesn't mean that you've necessarily had that, but that's kind of what that school requires. And then you're enrolled at least half time. If you're enrolled less than half time, you don't have to meet the student criteria. So this really shares like if you don't meet all three of these, you don't have to meet that additional criteria. Um, and then income guidelines. So these are the current income guidelines here in Oregon. Um, they get changed yearly. So it's important to kind of make sure you're up to date on that. Um, information. So it's really if you're at or below this income guidelines. But what I would encourage, if you're around this amount, please apply. You know, you can qualify for, um, you know, there are ways that they take into account your expenses. So those might make you eligible for SNAP, even if you're slightly over income. Um, and then there is additional criteria for students. So this additional criteria is really um, around some of what I was kind of speaking to earlier, which is some of the SNAP policy is really it, uh, at the federal level, sort of built to exclude a lot of students because it's assumed students have parental and family support to go to college and that they're um, in like a dorm setting and have um, 
meal plans, which we know is just really not the case for many, many students. That's not the norm anymore. So um, all of the eligibility that I'm gonna talk through is really about how to qualify for SNAP um, and not necessarily have to meet work requirements that are um, generally asked of students in order to qualify for SNAP. So that's something to know as kind of how we talk about this. So um, recently with the COVID relief bills, um, there has been expanded eligibility for students um, around SNAP. And uh, the one that passed at the end of December in 2020 um, did some temporary expansion of eligibility for students across the country that's tied to our federal um, pandemic emergency declaration. So students can now qualify for SNAP if they're eligible for work study. And what that means is it's not if you have a position, it's not if you've been awarded it, it's actually just if you're eligible for it. So if that came up through the FAFSA process, your financial aid, you didn't even, you don't even have to accept the award. Um, so it's really a pretty broad expansion of eligibility for work study because we know there's not enough positions for all that who are um, eligible for work study. So that's one way to qualify. And then another way is if you have an estimated family contribution of zero dollars on your FAFSA. Um, so these are two temporary ways to qualify for SNAP, not have to meet those work requirements for students. Um, and uh, what I would say is that colleges throughout Oregon have been trying to share out this information through their financial aid departments. Um, so information has gone out um, that uh, is targeted to students that are in this situation or somewhat more broadly. Um, so hopefully the word is getting out, but it's a great thing to share right now because it's pretty new. Um, but we also really want to ensure that students still qualify for SNAP beyond the pandemic. So um, something that's true here in Oregon is that um, if a student can make a connection between what they're studying um, in school, kind of if they're in an undergraduate program, so four years or less. Um, so it can look like if you're in a certificate program, if you're seeking your associate's degree, if you're seeking your bachelor's degree, if you can make a connection between what you're studying and a potential job you see yourself getting after you complete your studies, then um, if you're able to kind of articulate that during the interview with the Department of Human Services, um, then you can qualify for SNAP and not have to meet those work requirements. Um, so it's really great because it acknowledges, this eligibility acknowledges that many people seek college and higher education because they want a different career path and see kind of job potentials, um, higher wages as part of uh, going to college. So it sort of acknowledges that. And if you can make that connection, um, then that's a way to qualify. And I think the workers are really great about kind of prompting students in this conversation during the interview. But it's important to know this going in that that's something that you may need to do. Um, and then one thing around this is, um, with that kind of four years or less undergraduate degree, really what that talks about, it's not that you have to complete your degree in that amount of time or complete your studies in that amount of time. It's just kind of that's the general intentionality of how long that program um, takes um, to get uh, to learn, you know, and that's how what kind of it's tied to around um, undergrad. So one of the things here is that if a job is um, requires graduate school or kind of longer um, education, then um, that would not be a way to qualify in this way. So like if you're someone who's like, I'm gonna be a doctor and that requires like that longer studies that wouldn't qualify for this. But if you're studying um, undergrad and, and you're studying um, kind of pre-med or other um, kind of medical fields, you know, there might be a job that you can get um, that would just uh, be available to you with just that four-year degree. Um, so that's something to think about when um, kind of connecting with this way to be eligible. And then there are other ways to qualify too. So these are a few um, that are 
available to students and maybe um, ways that you might meet uh, requirements. So there are um, more information um, on our website, um, the SNAP for students, if you wanna learn more about those. But many students qualify in the ways that I talked about before. Um, so a few things just to note is that um, meal plans can affect eligibility, um, but it's about if your meal plan provides the majority of your meals. Um, so, you know, noting that when you're talking to a worker, if you do have a meal plan, if it's really only something that's um, providing a small amount of food, you know, I know many students um, can't afford a more robust meal plan if that's offered at their college um, because they're expensive. So if it's not really meeting um, the majority of your meals, then that shouldn't, um, disqualify you from SNAP eligibility. And then for some students, um, immigration status is a factor on, um, on being eligible for SNAP. So there's more information um, at the link provided. And just want to be really clear um, that SNAP is not considered a program um, for public charge. That was a recent um, change that it's not considered for public charge. So shouldn't affect anyone in any process around um, citizenship. So yeah, those are, that's the overview of kind of SNAP. It's very um, quick and a lot of information, but I hope there's more. Um, I think Elizabeth was sharing some of the links in the chat. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the process for applying for SNAP. We're going to kind of cover quite a few different things, um, including the application the interview, and then what to do once eligibility is determined. And so with the application, uh, some things that are really important to know when you're completing a, an application for SNAP benefits is that we are federally, um, we're by federal law, we're supposed to be processing all applications within 30 days of submission um, with the application. That being said, we also need to complete the application process within that 30 days, including obtaining any kind of um, documentation, such as income documentation, or uh, sometimes we do ask for uh, verification of student loans um, or scholarships. And so some of those um, documents may be needed. There can be an exception where we can have that 30 day period extended an additional 30 days if you um, if there's circumstances outside of your control and you communicate that to ODHS prior to the 30 day, uh, the initial 30 days expiring. So once you've got the application filled out and submitted, um, you can reach out to ODHS to schedule an interview. And then once you have your interview um, with the ODHS worker, the benefit eligibility worker, um, they will ask you any certain questions regarding just kind of like what Chloe was going over regarding student status. And they'll ask about other um, information regarding um, income and expenses, um, and then they'll determine eligibility. Once you're eligible, um, then you can go into a branch office and pick up an, app, uh, an EBT card, or you can call and have one mailed to you. You can go into a branch and have that PIN um, set, and that PIN number is set up by the recipient. Um, and then you get your benefits monthly, and those benefits are usually distributed on the day that aligns with the last number of your social security number. So if your social security number ends in a zero, you'll get it on the first. If your social security number ends in a nine, you'll get it on the ninth of the month. And so it just kind of spreads things out a little bit so that um, not everybody is going to the store at the same time of the month and just kind of makes things a little bit more equitable that way. Um, I think you can go ahead and move it forward. So um, the ODHS has recently um, launched a new 
profile to apply for SNAP benefits. And it's called Oregon One Eligibility. And what it does is it is, um, we call it the One system, and it is a place where you can apply for all benefits, including medical, SNAP, cash benefits, refugee assistance, things like that, um, domestic violence um, grant. Um, information. You can apply for all of that in one place um, on the one system. Um, it does have things built into where it verifies your um, identity. When you build your uh, case, you can upload documents to the one system. Um, you can follow up on the one system to see if there's anything needed or any messages that have come through. And so that can be a, just a really it's a really new and um, of this century uh, system. We used to work on an old DOS-based system, which was uh, from the 70s. And so we are definitely pretty excited to be moving um, forward with our technology to be able to help Oregonians uh, much more efficiently. That uh, rollout did just happen um, for Lane County in November, and the rest of Oregon has rolled out as far as, uh, as recent as uh, February. And so we can move on to the next. So once you um, submit your application, which you can submit it, not you're not limited to just submitted that application online, by the way, I did want to mention that you can submit an application. You can still come into a branch and get a paper application or download a paper application um, from online. Um, and you can submit that to a local office. Um, you can fax us a, a sheet that just has your name and address and signature stating that you're requesting SNAP benefits, and that may also work. And so the uh, once that application is submitted, then there will be an interview um, with a benefit eligibility worker. And in most cases, um, well, currently uh, with pandemic, we have been waiving some of those applications. And so if you have applied for SNAP and did not get a call or an interview, um, that may be why, but um, we aren't sure when exactly that's gonna end. Each month we're requesting that extension from the federal government. So that eventually will come to an end and interviews will become a requirement again. And so with the SNAP application, um, once you've submitted that and you've um, received a call or an appointment, you can either have that um, interview done over the phone. Um, we are not doing them in person currently just because of the pandemic, but as soon as uh, things are lifted and we get back to things being normal, then it is definitely welcome um, to do those interviews in person. And some, some people do really enjoy that. Um, if um, you think you may have missed a call regarding your interview appointment, it's really recommended to call your local office and get that rescheduled. Um, after your interview with the HS, um, you can talk to them about how your education relates to the intended job after graduation. So just like what Chloe was stating is that you wanna talk to them about what type of job that you're doing that's related to your to your um, current education that you're working on and that you want to uh, know how many meals your meal plan, plan pays for each week. And so as long as those meals are under 50%, then you should be okay. And then, um, excuse me. And so once you're uh, got your intake all done, um, the benefit eligibility will determine um, the eligibility tell you if you're approved or not. In most cases that's done um, in that moment, unless of course there's documentation that's still needed that they have to um, pen the application for. So um, wanna make sure that once you're approved that you do get that card um, and set up a PIN number so that you can um, use that in the store and use it like a debit card to access those benefits. Again, those benefits are dispersed once a month um, directly to your card, and you can even call this number listed here um, to find out what your balance is. And then there's even a, an app. And then if your card is lost, then you would wanna call that number and they'd get that uh, sent back to you. So, uh, one thing that we did wanna talk about too, if you wanna advance the slide for me, Chloe, 
I think that takes care of everything there, is that um, once you're receiving SNAP benefits, um, we have a SNAP training and appointment program called STEP, where we partner with different community agencies in the area that uh, work with us and work with the student or the adult or the youth um, who may be asking or looking for any type of employment or training um, services. And so if that's the case, there's a, a lot of different services that can be available, um, including financial assistance, such as if you need any type of work-related transportation, clothes for an interview, specific tools that are needed in order to take a job, those may be able to be su uh, supplied with, through the SNAP, um, the STEP, pro excuse me, through the STEP providers. Um, and of course, Career Advancement, LCC is one of our partners. And so um, they're a great resource for, you know, working on your GED or just ex expanding on your existing strengths and skills. Um, you know, any type of other things that you want to advance your career on. And um, if you needed like some type of supported work experience. There's also um, partners who help with building those job skills. So they can um, help you with your applications, interview practice, overcoming um, different barriers and things like that. And then there's other resources for like your home and family, childcare, other types of navigation, housing options and things like that that are available through our SNAP partners. And go ahead and advance the slide. And so this here talks a little bit about who our partners are. You can see our providers there at the top here in Lane County, Lane Community College, Goodwill, WorkSource Oregon, Lane County Health and Human Services, and Food for Lane County. And this slide here shows you a little bit about what each of these uh, different partners can uh, provide support for. And so for um, example, Lane Community College can provide uh, you know, GED and vocational training, job search and, um, and job search training and support, whereas Goodwill can also help with the support services um, and work experience. And so um, there is a lot here to navigate. So that brings me to our employment and training navigators that are housed at our, at our DHS offices. And so we have um, a team of individuals who work with that they're only job is to work with SNAP recipients to help them navigate employment and training services and nap, navigate the, the STEP program. And so if you're receiving SNAP um, and you are interested in finding out how you can be supported additionally, just a matter of calling our branch office, uh, any local branch office that's uh, close to you, and we can get you connected to an employment and training navigator to help you navigate um, moving forward. So, oh, and I think that's it for me. Does anybody have any questions regarding uh, the application process or the STEP program or the employment and training navigators? All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. So we wanted to share, um, now that you have your SNAP benefits, what are you able um, to purchase with those SNAP benefits. And so it really includes um, all food items. Um, so that is fruits and vegetables, protein sources, dairy, breads and cereals, other snack foods. And then also it includes seeds um, and plants. So actually things that can produce food. Um, some things that are not um, included are non-food items. Um, such as beer, wine, tobacco, um, some foods that are hot at the point of um, purchase. Um, but some things that are included are, you know, a take and bake pizza actually would be included. Can we go to the next slide? We also wanted to share a great resource. So with SNAP benefits, you can use your SNAP benefits at um, participating um, farmers markets throughout the state of Oregon. 
we really recommend you look up um, the available farmers markets. Um, below is the website, Double Up Oregon. But you can take your SNAP benefits to participating um, farmers markets and actually transfer off of your SNAP benefit card and receive the same equal amount in um, purchasing power at the farmers market. So it's called Double Up Food Bucks, but it's a way to really stretch your money at the farmers markets and to get more fruits and vegetables. Um, throughout this um, amazing summer season. Next slide. I also wanted to share with you um, our Food Hero, um, SnapEd Food Hero social marketing campaign. So, um, you know, I do SNAP outreach in Lynn and Benton County, but I'm also a SnapEd educator. And so it makes me feel really good that to advocate um, and educate around SNAP, but also um, help, you know, so people have food resources to actually use the nutrition education. But um, Food Hero was designed to help um, under-resourced families really stretch their food dollars. Next slide. So this is our social marketing campaign. You can visit it at foodhero.org and I, I encourage you to visit and explore around. Um, but from the beginning, it was designed and has been informed by our um, by SNAP participants under resource families. Every um, what we heard from families is they want tips and tricks um, to feed their family and recipes. And so it's really des designed around um, recipes, um, easy to use recipes, um, and it's also available in Spanish and English. So one thing to keep in mind is all recipes shared meet current dietary guidelines and materials and resources really are meant to serve an under-resourced um, audience. Next slide. So one way um, you can navigate the Food Hero, resource, uh, Re Food Hero, resource, Food Hero site is by searching through recipes. So they're available, of course, alphabetically, but you can also search by main ingredient. So let's say you have um, hamburger to use up or you have some broccoli to use up so you can search by main ingredient. Um, and maybe you have just a few minutes to make a recipe or produce food. And so there's recipes that are 30 minutes or less. Um, five ingredients or less, so maybe you don't have a lot of options, um, you know, in your kitchen. And then there's also kid, kid approved. And so these have actually been tasted and tested by kids and um, over 70% approve of these re uh, recipes. So sometimes moms are hesitant to try a new recipe, um, but now they, they can have confidence if other kids have liked it. Um, you can also search by meal types. So maybe you're looking for a breakfast recipe or a dinner or lunch snack. Um, there's specialty diets, so maybe you need to be dairy free or, um, you know, good calcium sources. And one thing, there's also a cooking method. So maybe you don't actually have access to, um, maybe you only have access to a microwave. So there's beyond recipes, there's other activities for youth. Um, there's video recipes attached to, um, to recipes. So maybe you would like to follow along someone who's making their recipe. So um, it's really meant to be user friendly. Next, next slide. Um, you can connect with Food Hero through social media, um, through the web, Food Hero web, uh, website, um, also through Facebook and Twitter, um, Pinterest, YouTube, Instagram. Um, on Facebook, they shared today um, a recipe that was produced in Umatilla High School students and part of their um, high school cooking class. And so um, kids were able to make the recipe at school and then got the ingredients to make the recipe at home as well. So it was really fun to watch that today. Um, next slide. And that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions um, around Food Hero or SNAP, um, SNAP Ed, just let me know. Yeah, I think we can, I guess, start the Q&A section. And one question I have is like, if you apply for SNAP and you think you might be wrongfully denied, what do you do? I mean, you know, is that it? I'm glad you brought that up, Elizabeth. I forgot to mention that. Um, so if you are denied on your SNAP application and you uh, disagree with the decision, it's encouraged that you reach out to the branch office. If you feel like the branch office is not uh, taking care of it or you're not um, being heard, um, you can always 
always ask for a hearing request to um, dispute the the decision that was made and um, it it will go up the ranks in order to make sure that the correct decision was made on that uh, application. And is it correct that you can have someone like sit in with you? Like if I wanted um, Tina, for example, to kind of sit in and kind of be like my backup for like <laughs> approaching um, people with DHS, is that possible? Absolutely. We would never, ever turn away another individual who is supporting or attending an intake with another individual. And so if that support is, um, or if you just want to bring your friend with you, like, no problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then another question is, is there like a time limit on SNAP? Um, do I have to reapply for SNAP? Uh, and how often? That's a loaded question because, uh, you know, ODHS is in a state of change all the time. Um, we currently have year long certification periods, um, but we may be moving to a six month certification period based on fed uh, federal decisions. And so um, I think the pandemic has kind of slowed down that we were expecting six month application or six month certification periods. Um, probably about six months ago or so, but it, it, from what I'm seeing, we're still having um, year long certification periods. So every year you'd have to reapply. And once it changes six months, you'll have to reapply every six months. Thank you. Um, and then another question is, um, I've been told that y'all, that you can apply for, sorry. Uh, I've been told that you can get more benefits through SNAP than just food assistance, um, like maybe funding to pay for your electric bill or something like that. Is that still a thing? Is that? What ODH does is if you're just receiving SNAP benefits and not receiving TANF, um, ODHS is very connected to the community. And so we are a great resource and uh, for different things within the community. And so if there is any type of a need for any type of basic needs, we would work really hard to make sure that we connect you um, with an agency who could support you and so provide that direction. Um, if you're receiving cash benefits in addition to the SNAP benefits, then there's some other additional supports that can be um, provided through that program, depending on the participation and and the way it's set up for that individual. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I just want to add that there are additional benefits. So let's say you're a little bit on the higher income and maybe you get awarded a zero SNAP benefit amount. And so just to let you know that 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 would you would still maybe qualify income wise for other food benefits such as free and reduced meals in schools. I know right now during COVID, everyone zero, you know one to eighteen qualifies for a school meal. But then depending on where you're at, the metro area has other benefits available. Um, reduced theater tickets. I've heard you know there's um, ways to get cell phones. Um, there is help with other um, non food benefits as well with um, being eligible for SNAP. Yeah, there are certain things like the Lifeline phone uh, thing that's available through the Public Utility Commission that just having been approved for SNAP qualifies you for those services. And so there are definitely a lot of other services out there that just because you have qualified for SNAP benefits, you meet their qualification for their programs and services as well. So it's always helpful to reach out to us and we can get you connected to who those partners are that we work with to get you connected. Someone is asking if unpaid internships can be listed as a work requirement because um, it's labor. I mean, it's free labor, but uh, <laughs> does that count? Yeah, so I mean, interested you can weigh in on this. You know, unfortunately, the um, requirements around the work requirements for SNAP, it requires paid employment. Um, so unpaid internships aren't considered that. I think there's a push um, from an advocate perspective where both the labor of school 
right, of actually being in your studies and the labor of doing unpaid internships, or if you have like a, a um, teaching assistantship or other kind of research assistantships um, should be considered work um, and meeting work requirements. So I know there was that like desire for that push at the federal level. Um, but uh, Trisha, please correct me if I am saying anything out of turn. I think you're you're right on there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then I guess can you talk about some of the reasons someone might not be approved for SNAP? Um, like maybe common things that happen that just barely cause someone to not be eligible or be approved. I can probably talk to that a little bit. Um, so communicating so if you were to communicate to the eligibility worker that you're working on your doctorate or you're working on um uh, your, what is it your postgraduate degree um outside of a bachelor's outside of a four-year degree if you communicate that um then they probably would have to look at your other ways to qualify, which would mean that you would have to be working 20 hours a week or meet some of those other um, qualifications. And so if you don't meet any of those other things and you've communicated that you're in a, a longer than a four year program, um, or you don't know what your job is gonna be when you, um, when they're asked, you know, when you graduate, what type of job you're going to be doing with that education, then that could be a cause for that denial as well if you don't meet the other eligibility requirements. Um, also, you know, over income is the biggest one. So um, if you don't turn in documentation that's required, so if you communicate to ODHS that you're receiving scholarship income, um, we, may, we would be looking at that income uh, depending on the amount. So if you don't provide us that documentation, we can't really review it to be able to determine that eligibility. Um, but typically, um, scholarship income doesn't make that much of a difference because we only look at the scholarship income. We wouldn't look at the grant income or student loan income. And we would look at that scholarship income against the cost of going to college. And so uh, that award letter, that financial award letter, I've never seen, and I worked in eligibility for some time, and I'd never seen anybody whose um, scholarship was greater than their cost of attending school. And so, but that is um, one way if that documentation isn't turned in as well. I think that's pretty much um, that if you don't meet the student eligibility and you don't meet the um, the income eligibility, those could be two common ways. Okay. And um, I guess someone is asking if you are like couch surfing, uh, but still need to show proof of residence. How does that work? Because um, I mean, that's not your home technically, right? We don't need proof of residence. We just need a mailing address. So somebody can be definitely couch surfing as long as we have a, a, a place to send mail. Um, we also have a list in our offices of different community partners who provide those mail services. So if that isn't accessible to you, we would also work with you to overcome that barrier. And um, I think that there was also a question about how much has food demand for how much has the demand for food assistance increased? It's really hard to tell um, because it definitely increased um, at the beginning of the pandemic. We were um, kind it was kind of like all hands on deck. So even those workers who were not processing SNAP as a regular part of their daily duties were being pulled in to process SNAP. So we did have a significant increase initially, and then it got skewed by us having this new one system and all kinds of other things going on that also made processing benefits uh, for Oregonians a little bit more challenging and took a little bit more time. So it's a little, a little complicated, but yes, initially, definitely. Okay, and I guess someone is asking why some people might not apply for SNAP. I mean, this resource is here. Um, why, I guess, are people hesitant? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, Trisha, and feel free to weigh in from the ODHS perspective. Um, you know, honestly, I feel like part of it, what we know when we um, work in kind of the staff outreach world is that, um, you know, it's, sometimes it's just a lack of information, not knowing what's out there, how to access it, and really how to be eligible. And I think that that's really true for college students in particular, um, because it's confusing. And also, you know, you're navigating so many different um, systems at the same time. Um, so I, I think that is a main reason. But of course, um, there's other feelings about um, the program stigma that may be associated with it from kind of the past. And that's something we really want to break down. You know, um, staff is here for you um, when you need it. That is just what it is. We all pay into it with our taxes and it's here for us when we need that support. Um, so I feel like um, that is some of the factors that also kind of affect student access and um, my coworker Venus is just really great about talking about this and kind of saying, um, we really see SNAP as like a food scholarship for students because it's giving you extra support for your budget um, during college, just like a Pell Grant or a scholarship would do um, for you. And that's a pretty common thing that students seek out. So. Um, that's something that we really wanna talk about. Um, oh, and thanks Tina for dropping in the chat, um, kind of where food insecurity has been during the pandemic, for sure. Um, we've seen food insecurity increase so, so much. I think we haven't seen SNAP access go up as much as we thought um, nationally, um, comparatively to food insecurity. And I think it speaks to we're really starting to feel food insecurity at many different levels um, of, of income in our country. And um, I think that's really addressing maybe where, um, again, staff is great, but you know, it's only for folks that are at a certain income threshold. You know, what are we doing for folks that are just slightly over that, but are still struggling? So I think that's um, some of the things we're starting to reckon with. Okay, anyway, sorry, I went into a different question, but thought I'd tie it together. Um, and someone is asking if uh, food assistance has increased during the pandemic. Uh, and I know Partners for Hunger Free Oregon kind of did a survey of students. And I don't know if y'all also surveyed how many people then applied for SNAP or if that's information you have, I don't know. Yeah, we've um, connected with students throughout the state primarily um, to have those conversations pre-pandemic. So we didn't survey necessarily students on kind of where their access was in the pandemic. Um, I think some really great information that's out there around kind of students and student access to resources is from um, the Hope Center um, from Temple University. They do a great job of showing that really students are under participating in SNAP across the country. And um, we haven't seen that change during the pandemic. Um, so uh, I think it really, again, points to access and information and getting connected to resources, which is even harder in kind of our more virtual setting. Um, so I um, would say that uh, there is some information on, because a number of Oregon community colleges participated in the HOPE surveys. Um, yeah, and uh, so that, but that was pre-pandemic. So it's, it's harder to get that information right now, but I think we'll probably see the results of that coming up in the, in the next year. Sorry, I muted. Um, <laughs> that make, unfortunately, that makes sense. Yeah, um, to see that increase. I guess um, maybe we can now open it up to kind of a floor discussion. We have Dre Aguirre here with us. He's a second year student at Central Oregon Community College. <laughs> um, he has experienced food and housing insecurity. 
And um, I also know he's an aspiring nursing student. So despite all of those odds, he's still going to college and uh, I'll pass it on to you. I'll let you kind of explain your story. Um, well, <laughs> what part of the story? Oh. Um, well, I guess I'll just do a quick, I, I mean, I've done so many different type of jobs that really wasn't fulfilling. Um, and that's, and in this pursuit of trying to find what I want to do, that's when I found I want to help people. And that's why I wanted to do nursing. This is all pre pandemic. So um, that's just something I want to do. I love just seeing or just having the opportunity to help others. It doesn't matter if I get thanked or not. Just, I just want to be there in some way, in some manner. And uh, I know a lot of that stems from my family, but I mean, I mean, that's, that's just, that's the road I'm on and I'm going to stick to it. Um, all right. Yeah. <laughs> and even now you've been helping students apply for SNAP, right? I think I read that in your um, public hearing testimony. Yeah, I, um, around, well, especially before the pandemic, during one made it more challenging. Um, but yeah, there was so many different students they were struggling, not having food, and they were, they felt ashamed, and they didn't want to ask for help. Um, I don't know how they got a hold of me, but in some way, they 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 able to reach out to me somehow, and I was able to kind of direct them and show them um, the best that I could. Um, unfortunately, because we didn't have anybody to tell us that we could get SNAP or you know any eligibility, um, I only found out because it was like a flyer in uh, our uh, multicultural room so I was part of different a whole bunch of different clubs and they said college students can get like snap and not have to work or something like that but you have to be full time so I was like okay I could do this and um so that that was kind of my motivation to help others like well, you know what it's available I mean you got to put that pride aside I mean it's hard I, I get it I mean I've been there I still am there but you know we're making it happen um but during the pandemic you know uh i had to kind of reach out to certain people that kind of see you know where they are and then i actually went to some of our um i forget what they're called <laughs> i don't want to say leaders just <laughs> people who are over like students those boss people i don't know what they're called sorry um and I asked them if there's still more uh, resources available and, you know, and they said there is, but not a lot of students know about it. So that's all I kind of been trying to do is make sure students are taken care of the best that we can, so. And I mean, I guess why, I guess what are some of the misconceptions um, that you think students have about SNAP? I mean, for me, I just assumed I'd be taking funding from like needier families. And so that was one of the reasons I didn't apply, but that's also not true, uh, we know, so. Yeah, no, that, that's probably one of the biggest ones is like, someone's like, you know what? They need it more than I do. I don't want to take, um, that's probably, like, that is the biggest one. I, for me, for the longest time, I was like, I didn't want to do it because there's a child that can use it um, or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's not true. <laughs> because they can get taken care of also you know um i mean to me, i mean it is important obviously um because nobody should be going hungry period but uh that was the biggest one like i said for me and then i know a lot of others are like i don't deserve it or i have this little job that i could barely make it in life i i, I can do it and i'm like no dude <laughs> there's actually a kid i talked to last term i was about that He's just like, I, I'm working. I can somehow survive. I was like, dude, that's not how it's supposed to be. You're struggling. You're eating that top ramen and like canned soup or something like that. I'm like, you, I mean, there's a better alternative. I know it's hard. I know it's hard <laughs> to accept it, but you know, it's okay. It's there for you to succeed. It's, you know, that's what I loved about Snap and I love the support around it. You know, they want kids to succeed you know, by food, getting them energy, getting them something to keep them going. Um, it's so easy to be discouraged and, you know, uh, just try to smooth or, you know, cruise by. And I mean, again, we can open this up to anyone who wants to share, but 
I guess, can you talk about, you know, why aren't there more resources for students and why is it kind of hard to get these resources to them? And I know that's kind of a, that's a tough point, question to answer, but there it is. <laughs> um, you know, asking, you said, why isn't there enough? Yeah, yeah. To be honest, I don't, uh, my biggest thought or what I've learned is a lot of people don't organization or there's a lot of people don't realize that like I think Chloe or uh, said it like they don't know that or they don't believe that students go hungry they think they're in the dorms they think they're being taken care of and all these different things when you enter college I mean that's like old style thinking I mean that's that's not how it is these days unfortunately um, um, so I think that's that's one of the reasons because I know there's a lot of resources for families, uh, single mothers, or, you know, things like that, which is incredible and there's a huge need, but I know that even like single parent mothers struggle, you know, when they're going to school to even get help, you know, they're working, they're going to school, they're working full time, you know, their mom, this is a friend of mine, I'm just kind of telling her story a little bit, and she couldn't afford, or she couldn't get SNAP or anything because you made a like, not too just a few was i don't know a hundred dollars more ten dollars more forget what it was um so she couldn't have a tap into that resource which was unfortunate um i don't know just like like i said i think we just get overlooked students doesn't matter what age they are you, you know maybe under 50 i don't know <laughs> just kidding yeah i mean one of the reasons i was really excited to do this project um which started out about homelessness mainly, um, was just because I think we think about homelessness in terms of like students K through 12, and then we have adult homelessness, which I think we think of more like 35, 40 year olds, but there's this gap of like 18 to kind of 30 year olds that we're kind of missing, I feel like, in terms of providing those resources and making sure that they're there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah. And I mean, I know for me at least, um, I remember just like walking down the street, talking to my mom um, when I was in college, which was what, like two years ago. Um, and she was like, why don't you apply for SNAP? And I was like, no, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to, or I didn't think I would be approved. I didn't think I would, I thought I was taking resources from other people. And I mean, it's also the like access is a big issue too, right? Um, I then have to like find the application, figure out how to, uh, fill it out, you know, I have to take time, you know, I was taking full course load, working at least one to three different jobs at any time. Um, you know, I think access and being able to have like a basic needs navigator, like Chloe was talking about, could really be beneficial for people. So that's my little rant. I agree. I agree uh, wholeheartedly with that. Um, I mean, we have people working part time at like COCC. Um, they try to help uh, a success coach. That's, that's what he, one of them is called, Marcus Legrand, who is a phenomenal dude, and he's always trying to help students. He's always there, and you know he'll actually reach out just because see how we're doing. I mean, but he's only part time, and I feel bad. You know, I'm like, I want to do more for him because what he does. I want to invest in him so because he reaches out to students you know, trying to help. And if he has the resources, if he has, you know, if we have that, that position that, you know, that we're going for, I mean, and that'll be such a relief. I know for a lot of incoming students and then current students. Yeah. So we'll see what this uh, legislative session has for us, has in store. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know if there are any other additional questions that anyone has, any comments, fun facts <laughs> you all wanna share? I just wanted to uh, thank Dre for all the work that you're doing for the students at, at LCC, right? And um, as, as a, a previous benefit and eligibility worker, I agree with you. Like one of the most common things I heard from people were that I don't wanna take benefits away from somebody else. And so we would have to go down that path of like, there's no limit on the amount of benefits that are available to us. So you're not taking anything away from anybody. Um, 
but yeah, let's, you know, the more that we can come together as a community to support our students, whether they're, you know, young or older, like myself, you know, I'm working on my bachelor's and I'm going to be done here at the end of this month. And so, yeah, it's, this is hard work, right? Like we don't have to also be hungry while we're trying to do this. And so um, the more that we can get people connected to SNAP benefits, the better. And I guess before we go, are there any last minute tips, suggestions that anyone has for someone applying for SNAP? Any need to knows? I feel like, you know, as a student and Tina, I see you unmuted too, so you should definitely chime in. I honestly think the, the best thing to do is to try you know, and I totally understand that it comes with a lot because it takes a bit to fill it out, to put yourself out there, to be vulnerable. Um, but like Dre was saying, it can be really worth it to support um, continuing to persist in college and know that we're all out here too, to help advocate um, for you as well. So no, like a lot of the colleges and um, a lot of our organizations, there are people who um, can help with navigating that like advocacy and um, for your for your case. So just want to put that out there and um, encourage that. Yeah, I just wanted to chime exactly what Chloe is thinking, really encourage students, anyone who thinks they are eligible to apply. I have had um, worked with DHS, helped families get you know, access. I've had really positive experiences with DHS worker, eligibility workers answering questions, being really patient. Um, and I look at this as an investment into yourself, right? You're doing the time and energy to better yourself through education. And this is a way to take care of yourself to ensure your, um, you have, right, the health and you, I, nutrition is tied to health to me. Um, so that's really a good way to invest in yourself too. But I, DHS is there to help. And I really, and they want people to apply if you think you're eligible. And like Chloe said, you may think you're not eligible, but DHS is really encouraging. If you think you're eligible, you should apply and um, they're absolutely there to get your questions answered or concerns or you think you were denied in any way. They, they are, they've been very um, open and um, it's, it's been a good relationship that I've had with, with ODHS. So I really, I hope more students apply because of this outreach that you're doing, Elizabeth and Dre. Yeah, exactly, Tina. It even if you're not sure you're eligible, you should still apply, right? If you're hungry, apply, just like Starla mentioned in the comments. And I did want to uh, draw attention to the comment where she um, ex expresses her love for the one system because it really does help reduce some of that stigma. And if people aren't sure, just go online, apply and go through the process and see what comes of it, right? So it doesn't hurt anybody. You don't have to go anywhere. Um, the system should be a little more intuitive, so it shouldn't be so challenging to complete those applications, although I'm not going to speak from experience because I haven't completed one on the one system myself. Um, but it is it is a really great um, way to get us more connected and um, re re remove some of those barriers to ac accessing SNAP. Great. Well, if there are no more questions, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, close us out. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I really appreciated this conversation, all of this information. I think it was so great. And hopefully community members will be able to better equip themselves for applying and using SNAP. Um, so thank you to Chloe Dodge, Chloe, uh, sorry, Tina Dodge, <laughs> Chloe Everhart, and Trisha Merrick, as well as Dre Geary for joining us. Thank you for to Randy Painter for technical assistance from LCC. Uh, this project was made possible through funding from the Education Writers Association, as well as the KLCC Public Radio Foundation. Um, this was recorded. So a version of this will be online and accessible for the future. If you need help applying um, or need a 
reference this again. Uh, this project, this event was also in conjunction with a series of stories about accessing college if you're low income or experiencing homelessness. And those stories are available in English right now and currently being translated into Spanish. So look out for those as well. And uh, thank you all again and have a good evening.